Richman, professor of economics and professor of political science at Columbia University. He joined Columbia in 1980 after 12 years as Ford International Professor of Economics at MIT. Professor Baguati is regarded as one of the foremost international trade theorists of his generation and has also made contributions to development theory and policy, public finance, immigration, and to the new theory of political economy. He is noted for combining important scientific contributions with an ability to dominate the public policy debate on trade questions of the day. He passionately believes that, and I quote him, in social science, such as economics, those who work at the frontiers of the science should also get down into the trenches of public policy in the only way they can, through advocacy. He is a frequent contributor to many influential papers, such as the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, to mention only a few. He holds a strong view that, and again I quote him, the society is best organized when its economics embraces openness, in particular in its trade and immigration, and when its politics is democratic, not just for the elite few, but in the effective participation of the many. Dr. Baguati was economic policy advisor to the Director General of the GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, from 91 to 93. He's been a director of the National Bureau of Economic Research and was recently advisor to Indians, India's Finance Minister on India Economic Reforms. In fact, his early work, especially India Planning for Industrialization, written with his wife, Padma Desai, also a distinguished professor at Columbia, provided the intellectual underpinnings of, for the major economic reforms now underway in India. Professor Bhagwati's impressive publication record includes more than 40 volumes, some translated into several languages and over 200 articles. He's also delivered many prestigious lectures and has won major prizes and awards such as Frank Seidman Distinguished Award in Political Economy in 98, Freedom Prize in 98, uh, Berhard Harms Prize, and many more. His teaching and writings have had an extraordinary influence on students of economics. Many of his former students are now prominent economists in their own right. In 94, scholars and students of economics from around the world gathered at the conference to honor Professor Bhagwati in celebration of his 60th birthday. Professor Bhagwati is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and has also been elected to the American Philosophical Society, the nation's oldest learned society. On a more personal note, I had a unique opportunity to spend these two days with Professor Bhagwati, and I've been very impressed with his genuine enthusiasm, his passion for the field and current economic issues, and his intense and inexhaustible energy that even the youngest among us might envy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bhagwati. <clears throat> um, President Stoyer, uh, my fellow economists and friends, and particularly the young students uh, who are here, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Svetlana, for those wonderful remarks. It's customary to say, when one is praised in that way, that my grandmother would have believed it, but I don't. Uh, but my wife, who flip-flops between putting me on a pedestal and putting me in my place, uh, she would have said, if she was here, that Svetlana said nothing that my husband hasn't said better before. <laughs> so, um, let me get on with um, globalization. It's become a buzzword. Um, I had to review Tom Friedman's famous book on the subject in the Wall Street Journal about three years ago. And I remarked that, you know, the end of the Cold War and globalization have become two buzzwords. And if your girlfriend throws you out, uh, or, you, you know, or your boyfriend is, uh, throws you out, then the cause has to be one or the other. <laughs> Everything is attributed. And this is part of the problem, actually, which I want to come back to, particularly when addressing some of the concerns which Dr. Cobb in particular eloquently expressed yesterday, that the cause and effect are of two different phenomena, uh, one bad one like poverty and another good one in my judgment like globalization. That is really the question at issue and so I, I want to return to that. 
But globalization, aside from being a buzzword, is, is in this, you know, as we know from the streets of Seattle, Prague, Washington, DC, uh, fortunately not you, your streets uh, during these two days, has become more or less a four letter word. Actually, if you count the number of letters in it, it says a 13 letter word, which is probably uh, the cause of all the problems. It's an unlucky number, but uh, <laughs> you would also understand then why the phenomenon describes us in so much trouble in the public policy space. The street theater has naturally received a lot of media attention in reflecting the, the tactical genius of the people who are doing it. Uh, it's a kind of modified version of the guerrilla tactics where you um, strike at unforeseen places to get your enemy, which is much, much stronger. In this case, you actually strike at well-known places uh, where you can be anticipated to be there, at conferences of international institutions, as Joe Stiglitz was reminding us today, where the elites of the world uh, gather to discuss globalization. Uh, the reporters certainly lap this up because if anybody who has attended these conferences knows they're dreary as hell. Uh, and anybody who unfurls a flag or carries a placard, and particularly if they throw stones to Starbucks and so on, um, naturally gets played up. Uh, and this is brilliant tactical strategy. But an interesting thought does occur, that our media does play up these things, and I'm not complaining, just recording. Um, but when it came to our own political conventions and uh, the two Demo of the Democratic and Republican parties, then somehow the coverage of the street theater was much and much lower key, and it sort of reminded me of the Israeli story where somebody uh, <laughs> asked the Israeli father during the Soviet bloc days, you know, what are your three children doing? So, oh, one son, uh, the first one is in Russia, Soviet Union. So what's he doing? Oh, he's building socialism. Uh, what's the second one doing? Oh, he's in Hungary, doing what? Building socialism. And your third son, he's in Israel, building socialism? Good God, what do you mean? That's our own country. <laughs> so, uh, street theorem is marvelous. Uh, very productive, very creative, as Joe was emphasizing this morning, when it's directed at things which don't immediately impact on your welfare uh, in a particular way. So I'm a slightly cynical about it, about the street theater part. But why, uh, you, you have to ask why this has sort of taken on. And I, I want to also mention that there are, in fact, several NGOs, non governmental organizations, I'm going to come to that, are actually not in the street theater game. They're actually serious people raising serious questions, and I want to turn to those a little further down the line. But let me just ask, why is it that the street theater, you know, I mean that in a non-pejorative way, why is it that it's so dominant right now uh, in, the, in the public space? And why are our young people, who, who in my experience are always idealistic and wanting to do something good, uh, what is it that that's driving them to these particular attitudes at this particular point where they want to take on globalization as this gigantic evil force which has to be constrained, reshaped, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I, th I think, uh, in a way, the, the explanation has to lie in w what I call the Fukuyama, Fuko, uh, double whammy. Uh, Fukuyama, as you know, wrote about the end of history, uh, the end of ideology, uh, that capitalism is triumphed, and this triumphalist spirit is really what's driving the young people who crave for social justice. That's the time when you want to be, and some of us hopefully have it still further on as we get older. But this concern, I think, really bothers them because capitalism traditionally has been presented and understood as a force which is really pure markets, pure capitalism, and in some unbridled sense, and that that really is harmful, doesn't pay attention to equity, justice, equality, poverty eradication, and so on and so forth. So the image of, so, of, uh, of a, a, a system which really uh, is not good, to say the least, uh, that being triumphant, I think does create uh, dissonance in your system. Uh, and I think in a way it's a sort of rebellion against capitalism uh, itself.
which you're finding. And, and that, is, that is really, uh, it's a lack of choice because also communism, which when I was young, that was an alternative. My earliest book in 1966 actually ends the first chapter by citing the Soviet success in many respects. And that's what we were all brought up to believe in those days when we were idealistic. That system we know is bankrupt and has collapsed. So there's lack of alternative. Um, and a lack of alternative, meaningful alternative, effective alternative drives you into this kind of dissonance. Of course, too many choices can do that too. I mean, there's, like, there's a story of the guy who goes through the psychiatrist working on the assembly line, and he says, you know, I'm going bananas, and the psychiatrist says, why? He says, oh, I'm on the assembly line sorting out the good apples from the bad apples, decisions, decisions all the time. Uh, so sometimes, you know, having too many choices also uh, uh, can be harmful. But lack of it is, is equally harmful. Uh, so I think that's, that's the first one which I detect as I interact with students, uh, including at Seattle in the streets because I was there. And when I wasn't debating with Ralph Nader, who is actually a good friend, I'm going to send him $1,000 uh, for his campaign uh, uh, because I think that voice needs to be heard. Um, but I, uh, my debates are about, you know, whether free trade is good and so on and so forth, and we are on excellent terms. Um, but when I went out in the streets when I wasn't doing that sort of thing with the more sort of intellectually oriented uh, NGOs, I did talk with the young, and, and basically they were concerned, uh, and they were not sort of chaotic, you know, the wrong kinds. They were idealistic, they wanted to learn. Then there's also the other, the, the, what I call the Foucault, the, the French philosopher's approach, which is the post, for those of you who are in English lit, it's postmodernism, deconstructionism, uh, all that stuff, subaltern studies, looking at things from below rather than from above, and so on. All of that tends to degenerate into an anti intellectual strand, although it's very highly intellectual. I mean, if you can you know, quote French philosophers, um, there's nothing more plonky than that. Uh, <laughs> And it really is very impressive. But the net effect of something like deconstructionism, for example, is to lose all anchor, any kind of moral uh, standard. And you see that in, the, in, in, in many of the people who, who follow that. And I think there's an anti-intellectual strand which follows from the which I think you see in the sort of more violent kind of um, tactics which are used. And here I have another, um, you know, they're anti-expertise of any kind. You know, you're an economist, so why should you have any particular claim to knowledge about economic matters, everybody's voice should be heard, including uh, of anybody who has a sort of stake in the system. And the, the story from the days of Cambo uh, the Cambodian situation and the anti-Vietnam War, when I'm told in Heidelberg the students demanded, who were particularly radical, they demanded that ev in every class, the professor teaching the class must be as ignorant as the students because that would be the only condition under which you could have free, democratic, uh, balanced inquiry. Uh, I would love to go up to my chairman and say, look, that's what I would like to <laughs> I would love that system, because that would mean I would have to prepare for no class, and I would be on a perpetual sabbatical, which actually some of my, which some of my colleagues are, actually. <laughs> so, um, so I think there are these different types of strands which define the ethos. I mean, it's not, it's not a complete description, but, but the, the, the passion with which the, the young idealistic kids are going out and doing this and worrying about it, I think this is certainly one of them. And then I think there's also what I call the fallacy of aggregation. Joe today, this morning, uh, Joe Stiglitz, touched on how there were different types of globalization. I was glad he mentioned that because typically people view globalization, it's just one of these funny words which embraces lots of things, but it, is, it does consist of lots of things. It's like a vector if you're in vector algebra uh, with lots of elements in it. Uh, he mentioned some, but I would particularly say there's trade, globalization in the sense of international integration and contact between countries, nation states and communities goes on in the field of trade, so th there'd be a free trader like me. Uh, then it goes on in the field of short-term capital flows, which is a very different kind of animal, as Stiglitz correctly emphasized this morning. Then there is um, direct foreign investment or corporations, multinational corporations, which are, again, a source of uh, great dispute uh, in terms of their impact. 
And then there is migration, which I, Joe Stiglitz forgot to mention, and that's a very important dimension, particularly you know, immigration policies, etc. cetera. Um, people tend to, and then there are of course non-economic aspects of globalization, diffusion of ideas, as he said, diffusion of culture, or suppression of culture, trade affecting culture and so on, uh, upsetting indigenous communities, as Dr. Cobb pointed out, those kinds of worries. So you have non-economic and economic, but within economic globalization, there's huge numbers of very different things. Now, the first thing which we sophisticated economists would say is that we have to distinguish among all of these, uh, both economically and politically. Uh, if I exchange my toothbrush for your toothpaste, um, it would need a deranged mind and a wild imagination to think that that could precipitate an Asian financial crisis. Uh, I mean, it would be wonderful if trade had that power, um, but it doesn't. Uh, on the other hand, you take the Asian financial crisis where Washington imprudently and hastily pushed for globalization, for freeing of capital flows. I think definitely precipitating or helping precipitate as a principal factor the immense crisis, which actually, if you know, the Smoot Hawley tariff of you know, 1931, uh, which was the biggest man-made you know, bipartisan, we always beware of bipartisan consensus. Uh, uh, but, uh, that was a, a big man-made disaster. This is the biggest one after that. And people, Washington doesn't want to own up to it and I'm all power to Joe Stiglitz and, and me and many others who, who actually are trying to point this out. That is a very different animal. When we point this out, of, and we have to attribute that. It's, you, know, you might ask, why did, why did it happen? Why did we push for this? When in the classroom, uh, when we teach economics, we, we point out that this is a dangerous thing, that in fact you can get these kinds of crises. We know from you know, my old teacher, Charlie Kindleberg, who first wrote about panics, manias, and crashes, uh, he's become famous again uh, because you know, it's been prov proven and so we know historically this is true. He's gone back about 200 years documenting these kinds of crises. And every time I open the mail from him, he's about 82 now. And then he's taken it back another 100 years and pretty soon he'll reach the Garden of Eden. Somehow there'll be a financial crisis there. Uh, <laughs> and it's something you can't forget. How come brilliant macroeconomists at the IMF and the Treasury forgot? And that's where I've come, you know, I've come up with this notion of the um, Treasury Wall Street complex. Wall Street, just as we professors like tenure, I'm not in favor of it particularly, but uh, that's because I would expect to find a better job if I got lost the current one, so it's not entirely disinterested advice. Uh, but tenure is something which all professors want, most of them. Similarly, Wall Street wants more and more profits to be made through opening up of financial markets. And the Treasury went along with it, and Joe gave a particularly stark version. So I call it the sort of the Treasury Wall Street complex. If you look at it in sociological terms, the same people are going back and forth continuously. You can find on the boards of many of the Wall Street firms the people who just came out of the previous administration or who are headed there. And this is Wright Mill's power elites. So now, Eisenhower talked of the military industrial complex. Uh, Wright Mills, who was a professor of sociology, and, and Eisenhower, as you know, was president of Columbia for a while. And Wright Mills talked about the power elite in the, in the networking sense. And I've talked of the Wall Street industrial complex, which is now pretty widely used in sociology and political science uh, to, to do this. So I'm also at Columbia now since 1980. So we are now known as the Columbia Trio. Uh, which is probably the next best to being the Spice Girls or the Beatles. Uh, but it certainly gives to my neoliberal tendencies a nice radical cast, you see, and it confuses everybody. Uh, so that financial crisis, short-term capital flows, was purely a result of a cynical manipulation uh, of the system in various sorts of ways, and there are you know, books to be written on that where we imprudently pushed for, for this and then precipitated the crisis. Um, that's a very different order of globalization. And the task of people like me who want to push for freer trade is immensely complicated because the common person, 
doesn't distinguish between one type of globalization and another. They think if the East Asian financial crisis came about, that devastated people into back into low, very low levels of poverty. The 1994 uh, peso crisis in Mexico led to a decline of real wages uh, in a very big way. Nothing to do with NAFTA, zero. Actually, NAFTA helped us bring money, uh, bring, bring uh, in fact, prompted us as the U.S. government to go and help out during that crisis. If we didn't have enough to and greater political commitment to that area, it would have been more difficult, I think, to get the thing through Congress. So if anything, NAFTA, which was trade-oriented, the, uh, the North American free trade area, uh, that was really uh, a moderating, had a moderating effect. The real problem with real wage decline has to do with the financial crisis. So I'm not going to defend financial crisis and financial flows. Uh, I'm not on any boards of Wall Street firms and so on, and I don't consult with the Treasury. So I, I have tenure and I can be independent. Uh, as I write in that book, which Svetlana mentioned, uh, a professor's primary obligation is to be a public nuisance. Uh, that's the only way he, can, he or she can make, produce public good. Uh, because nobody else can tell the truth because they, they might lose their jobs. So they would have to be heroic, and I'm not a hero. <laughs> um, so I think that, now you take immigration, which is another important thing, uh, because I think many of us who believe about in human rights and so on would, would re recognize that the freedom to emigrate, emigrate are, are important things we would want to, that are even more important than freedom to trade, in my judgment, uh, and the ability of people to, to, to get out of countries which they don't approve of is extremely important, but the ability to get into countries that they do approve of uh, is, is strictly regulated. Now, you can't apply the same economic philosophical principles because you, you simply can't sociologically, politically, etc., say, look, I'm for abolishing all border barriers. It's, it's, it, it politically and sociologically, it's very difficult to argue that. Uh, communitarian, all sorts of arguments, you know, different philosophical principles can be invoked. So economically, politically, you know, you have asymmetries between all these types of globalization, uh, and there are different ways of dealing with them. So I think part of the burden we bear on, on trade, which, which is what I'm going to come to short, is, is because as Joe said, that was what I was supposed to be doing, so I'll, 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 I'll oblige him, uh, and that's where we have greater burden to bear. And so the first thing to, to, to have a reason debate and a reason solution to the governance of this great phenomenon of globalization is to first begin to differentiate. Uh, and that's what economists typically do. One of my Oxford teachers said that e economists reach agreement by sharpening differences, meaning you're using a different model from me. As soon as I understand that, I know why you're coming to a different conclusion. Or you may be having the same model, same sort of ideal type to look at reality, but you may be using different parameters, different est you know, estimated or imagined parameters. So you come out with a different answer. And so economists reach agreement by sharpening differences, and politicians by obfuscating them. They just cover it up with language. So, uh, probably an example you saw last night. Uh, on television. So, um, so that is the, so I feel as a public policy intellectual that really if we, if we tell people, look, let's not mix up things and right, let's take each one at a time uh, and say, look, what is it that's wrong? So I do not believe in gung-ho financial capitalism, unregulated free flows, that's dangerous and it's almost calculated to bring crisis. But I do believe in freer trade, but again with appropriate governance, appropriate institutional structures, because that too, you cannot be left totally to itself, uh, but in a very different sense. Okay, so now I come, go from the streets, as it were, where, where the kids are very excited and worried, to the genuine worries, which but by genuine worries, I, I again don't mean that they are necessarily well taken once you analyze them, but let me just mention some of the ones which have come up in our own discussions. One is that the poverty in poor countries is because of globalization. Now, I would say yes, if you mean financial crisis can really hurt your poor in a very dramatic way. I not merely concede that, but I claim that. Okay, that's not the issue. Is freeing of the trade, uh, 
is the prosperity that it's, in my judgment, it brings about. Is that really a cause of poverty? Does prosperity or wealth creation go inversely with eliminating or elimination of poverty? That's an issue because many people believe it, and I think Dr. Cobb was sort of kind of, you know, citing some, some people who were of that view. The other is income distribution has worsened, uh, particularly in our part of the world, in the rich countries rather than the poor countries. Uh, so there the problem again is uh, multi, many fold. Are incomes at the top increasing because of globalization without their being shared by others? And two, more directly, the, uh, is poverty actually increasing? You know, forget about in inequality. Because to some extent, inequality is a construct of the statisticians and economists. I mean, if, I, if George Soros's income doubles or his wealth triples from one billion to three billion, I mean, what do I care? I mean, it doesn't mean anything to anybody, really. Uh, so if I then measure the income inequality, uh, certainly, like if Soros's income has gone up on Park Avenue in Manhattan in New York by a, another billion, of course, the top 5% in Manhattan will be by, obviously getting more, and the top and the bottom 5% will be getting less. But so what? It has no sociological, political significance, in my view, in itself. And in fact, if some people who are at the bottom heard about it, they might think, oh gosh, it's like the lotto ticket has gone up, right? I mean, the lotto prize, which is a lottery ticket. So if your mobility in the system you may even think this is a superb thing. You may not be resentful, envious, or, or you know, upset with it. You might celebrate it, saying, golly, you know, it's possible to make so much money in this great society. So, they may, so everything depends on the nature of your society, the way people react. And I'm worried more about the consequences of such wealth. Like, what are they doing with it? If they're spending it on yachts and conspicuous consumption, that could create problems, like the Mercedes-Benzes in, 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 in Russia and the traffic there. But if they're spending like Bill Gates on giving $30 billion for AIDS, uh, I'm glad he gets it. He, he's made so much wealth because that, the consequence of that is that you're really doing something for the poor in Africa where the real poverty is. If it was divided, if that $30 billion was earned by all of us in this room, uh, well, and the multitudes, we might just buy another car, each one of us, or, or another television set, or go to a movie. Uh, through the year, you know, uh, do, uh, buy opera tickets, and nothing would be done for the poor. So wealth in itself, or inequality, is something which is a very complicated phenomenon. I, the cause of it is interesting from an analytical point of view. I don't think it has much to do with globalization. Uh, it has to do with the growth of financial sector, growth of IT, and so on and so forth, which to some extent the growth of markets enables you to do that. But it's the consequences of that which really interest me, rather than the causes of it, uh, because we do have quite a di remarkably different situation today with the kinds of fortunes that are being made. So again, income distribution, is it really worsening? I first say it's not a particularly interesting question as against poverty. <laughs> and two, is it still due to globalization? If you, if you happen to be perverse enough to be interested in it, right, or, or, or you're an economist and then you are perverse and you're interested in it, uh, then go ahead and, and analyze it. But in that case, I don't think globalization will, of, of the trading system, for instance, will, will, will have much to do with it. Uh, and I'll argue that in a moment. And the third question, of course, which worries people quite naturally, uh, many uh, environmental and cultural groups, is that culture tends to be overwhelmed by trade. Uh, and Dr. Now, we Americans are very different in that regard because we are a country of immigrants and we absorb culture all the time. Uh, and so we never, th you know, we, I was in Berkeley one year and you go out onto Telegraph Avenue, and you know, you first you've got to get past the Hare Krishna groups, uh, and then you get onto the, you know, to the Telegraph Avenue, and then there's Indian music one week, and there's Chinese acupuncture the next one. I mean, this continuous turnover of different traditions, and, and uh, New York is not so bad, but it's New York is still full of vibrancy. Uh, 
So we, we, we are not exclusivist in terms of absorbing foreign influences because we're a country of immigrants. And that gives us a very special outlook on culture we don't feel threatened by. And two, on the export side, once all these different influences go through the sausage machine in our country, then they emerge as our, the culture we export. And in my view, the, uh, it's our high, we have to distinguish between high culture and low culture. It's the fact that we are pushing in the high culture women's rights, students' rights, children's rights, everybody's rights. I mean, that is continuously threatening other people, other feudal traditional societies. And, and by God, it's good it is, because that's, the way, that's what I would like to see diffused. So main, much of the anti-Americanism which comes out, and therefore anti-globalization, is simply a reaction to the fact that we are at the cutting edge of uh, uh, what I call high culture. But then there are people also write in this uh, thing about McDonald's and so on. So, you know, what does it really matter? I mean, you know, McDonald's can go everywhere, but Marshal Beauvais of France has picked on that. And he's fused culture and agriculture. He wants agricultural protectionism. He doesn't want the French agriculture to contract. And he's got hold of the, of the cultural argument saying McDonald's is an invasion of, of our space. And my only answer to that is that McDonald's gets adapted everywhere. I was, since we are in a Swedish college, basically, and I have Mrs. Solman following me, uh, there's, there's a story which is told of a Swedish grandfather who came to visit his granddaughter, and I'll make it Barnard in uh, college in, in, in um, New York, which is the sister college of Columbia. And he was telling her, yo, yo, they even have McDonald's here. So, you know, he thought it was something Swedish. So, <laughs> uh, so I think, except for a few wackos, nobody really is worried about the low culture diffusion. Uh, it goes all over the place. But because we are in that, but I think we on the whole, since we are at the cutting edge of exporting our ideas, and, and, and we do not feel any threat because of immigration being our defining ident sense of identity, uh, we take in everything without any sense of threat. I think whenever anybody else raises cultural questions, our first reaction is to say, that wretched fellow must be a protectionist or something pushing some special interest. So we've never been able to understand these phenomena, like on the hormone-fed beef, for example, to give you an idea. I mean, this is where <clears throat> we have produced the hormone-fed beef. Uh, I suppose it's okay, I, I must be eating it off and on. Uh, I'm more worried about cholesterol than about the hormones, actually, since I have a heart problem. Um, so that, I think, uh, you go to England, get into cabs, every cab driver says, you know, we shouldn't have this. They're worried, like, worried sick about it. Now, our culture is basically takes technological change on the, you know, much more than many other countries. We are a pill-popping culture. If you come from outside, you see that. I mean, I still worry about taking something. Uh, you know, is it good? Do I need it? But, you know, here people pop pills. And then, you know, this is a land of Viagra and of silicon implants. Uh, you know, as one wit put it, I think, in Wall Street Journal or somewhere, you know, we are turning into a nation of artificially enhanced women being chased by artificially aroused men. <laughs> so our, our cultural attitude is that of, you know, how do we use technology in the service of our own pursuit of pleasure, whatever we want to pursue? And that's not the way. There was a New Yorker cartoon, which I'm very fond of, where instead of being afraid of what are called Franken foods, genetically modified foods, uh, that cartoon conveys exactly the average reaction of many people in this country who therefore don't feel threat threatened by. And there's a, a chap in, the, in a restaurant, and you know, he calls the waitress, and there's a plate of broccoli in front of him, and he says, take this broccoli away. It doesn't taste any good. Get it genetically modified. <laughs> Now, that is our attitude. How do we use technology rather than it is a minefield and we have to sort of tread around it and really be aware of it? So I think that is creating, again, problems vis-a-vis -vis other cultures. So there are issues which are cultural, and I think we fail to understand that. We fail to understand why Europeans, for instance, and the Koreans worry about their cinema. And 
how Hollywood, which is a, a lobby which um, Joe forgot to mention, Mr. Valenti plays for Hollywood in a very big way. And so we are continuously opening up, you know, to our cinemas, foreign markets. And of course, as you know, Hollywood contributes a lot of packed money to certainly my party, uh, the Democratic Party, uh, probably some, I don't know how wealthy Charlton Heston is, but whatever he has, he must be giving to the other side. <laughs> but certainly we play for our cronies, because that's what they are, Spielberg, Barbara Streisand, etc., our president's cronies. But they're rewarded not like in, by Suharto, by creating monopolies for them or giving them special bakshish just for their movies. You play it for Hollywood and you open up foreign markets. So we just steamroller everything, you know, uh, and say, you've got to open up. You can't possibly have quotas and so on and so forth. We refuse to understand that other countries are worried about their cinema, about their culture. Uh, because we don't feel threatened. Therefore, why should they feel threatened? And I think there again, I'm going to come back to it because if we have, we have to recognize it. And free traders have, you know, if you read my textbook, uh, God forbid, uh, <laughs> there's a whole chapter on what are called non-economic, meaning not just bread and butter objectives which societies have. And how do you reconcile as far as possible free trade with those pursuit of objectives? It's not denying that there are such objectives uh, or the validity or the legitimacy of such objectives, but can we somehow rescue free trade, which is a silver force for social good in my opinion, and make it go with other ways of addressing these concerns? So instead of having quotas on Spielberg's movies or of foreign movies uh, on European television, could we just sub subsidize French cinema and let them compete, let consumers have choice, uh, let Spielberg compete with Renoir, who is actually then assisted and doesn't have to, or, or if you remember your green card movie, uh, Gerard Depardieu, I mean, it would be nice if he was employed there and didn't have to marry Andy McDowell in order to get the green card to work here. Uh, so it's, you know, so I think it's that kind of, uh, the alternative instruments which are actually more efficient compared to having quotas and trade restrictions, which could then help you preserve your culture, not always, but you know, they can, and still have free trade. So those are the kinds of issues which I want to get into a tiny bit more. I Just raise your hand, Svetlana, anytime I go overboard. Because after Joe took uh, two hours, I think, uh, I feel that a license on my part is entirely called for, particularly, <laughs> since he wants equity between developing and developed countries. <laughs> but, but do stop me, please, because I can, you know, professors go on forever until further notice. <laughs> so culture and trade, very important issue in my judgment. It is terribly. Uh, I didn't mention Dr. Cobb's indigenous community. I mean, that's another issue where I'm a little more complacent, but um, if I forget, you can ask later. And finally, the big, one big issue today is trade and the environment. There was a nice poster outside which was aimed saying trade kills environmental law. And by that, I think that was aimed at the World Trade Organization, which I'll come to later, because that's the institutional structure with its own rules, which can then affect environmental law and regulations. But I'm talking right now about just trade. Let's assume there was no GATT, no WTO, nothing no Larry Summers to bother Joe Stiglitz and so on and so forth. Uh, we can still stay with it, right? And just say that here is a phenomenon, an integration that's going on, and does that kill the environment? But here I think economic theory does help you again think about it a little more systematically because when you have, and I'll go back to Dr. Cobb, who's, I mean, I'm paying you the tribute of responding to some of your concerns because I think they were very well put. He said, trade, uh, that, let me talk of growth because I believe trade does help growth. So I'll make that transition to growth and say, he said, if growth affects the environment, uh, and we must look at net economic welfare. Another way of putting it is, is to draw on the principles which we have in, in the theory of international trade policy, which is that if you are growing or liberalizing trade, which will amount to more apparent growth, actual estimated growth, 
that could still immiserize you, as I said in an article in 1956, the first one I ever wrote, which has given me the, impre you know, the reputation of being a radical in Sorbonne, I ga gather. So this is why I've never visited it to disabuse them. Uh, uh, that's because when you have a market failure, the investment, the growth, may actually be taking you in the wrong direction. Because the markets, if they are not functioning, and if prices in the markets which guide our decisions to, for allocation of resources and therefore for growth, if they are not functioning correctly, they're not providing the socially correct signals, then you can be harming yourself, which is an extreme example. Or the growth might be actually less than you think, and when it's substantially less, it may even be get you into what we economists call negative growth, highly infelicitous phrase. It just means, you know, hurting yourself. So that's what I call immiserizing growth. And that is, another way to put it is that, okay, in that case, fix that market failure, fix that failure, and then you can get back to growth and free trade. Namely, if you have, if you have a pollution problem in the, in the environment, have a polluter pay principle. The fact is, don't let people just spew all kinds of carcinogens into the air or into the waters. Um, governments then have to come in and create those markets, which means, so, so we as citizens work through our governments, because that's not necessarily our enemy like in the libertarian literature. I mean, we work through governments because we couldn't have a big, gigantic meeting of millions of people and, you know, take that action. So we have to be worked through our votes in government, through the agency of government, which then institutes the market which was missing, namely one like, like a tradable permit. So if I am doing some harm to the environment, then I have to pay for it. Because you, otherwise, you, you, you know, your lungs will get affected and so on and so forth, like with acid rain or ozone layer may completely imperil the human race and so on. So that is, so the answer to this, some of these concerns like trade and the environment, is that you need additional policy instruments. Once you've fixed those failures, created the markets which are missing is another way to put it, then we can get back to reducing the government interventions which are actually harmful, like tariffs and trade barriers. And I was telling Dr. Cobb yesterday that um, in a way, you see, the, the, the marriage of views between trade, free trade and environmentalists can occur, uh, you know, as soon as you realize that we can't, trade economists come from, from trade, naturally, <laughs> and thinking about it, and we th usually see governmental intervention as that of create, responding to special interests, protectionist interests of one kind or another, and then putting up all kinds of tariff barriers and trade barriers of the kind Stiglitz was describing. So we think of the government as actually an instrument which creates the market failure, which creates the distortions, you know, which are going to be hurting, screwing up growth and, and its efficacy and the prosperity. Environmentalists come from a different tradition they're looking at areas where there are no markets. People are just spewing things out, right, and harming the environment, and they're missing markets. So they see government aid intervention as a way in which you create markets. So the whole uh, mindset, you know, I'm talking the psychological mindset of the free traders is that governments are basically doing bad things in their own area, and we've got to fight that and bring it down. And the environmentalists think of governments as doing good things which are required. And once you marry those two thoughts, eliminate the bad interventions of the trade side and create the good interventions on the environmental side, and you're bliss, right, under any church, right? So you, it's the, another way of putting it is that if you have two targets, you need two instruments, or as our forefathers and foremothers used to put it in every language and every culture that I've investigated, you cannot kill two birds with one stone. So if you go and try and fix the environment by going for protection, you, you're likely to reduce world income, your own income, and you're not going to be doing very much for environment anyway, because that's not an instrument appropriately designed to do anything. So when I wrote a report when I was economic policy advisor, I helped write it, I shouldn't take all the credit. Um, we had precisely this discussion just to tell our environmentalist friends 
that look, this is a way to do it, and also to point out that if supposing if you have environmental failure, that doesn't mean that somehow protection will do the job for you, that protection will be better than free trade. You just don't know. So we produce to, because when something is not working on one side of your household, it doesn't mean that what was really the correct policy, if everything was working properly, should be done in this area either. So, but it doesn't mean, you know, we, we, each, 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 there's nothing really, this is called second best theory in economics policy. Uh, and, you know, you can rank order trade and protection depending on the parameters of the case. So you have to go case by case by case. And we produced two examples, like in agriculture. Uh, and we, one of the, the agriculture, we showed that if you moved away through trade liberalization, away from the European agriculture, which was heavily pesticide intensive, artificially protected, and that as a result of trade liberalization went to developing countries. First, it would produce more income on the farm, which many of us would like on the distribution side. Two, it would also be economically more efficient because these countries are better, you know, naturally endowed with ways of producing uh, agricultural output. So it would produce more income also, not just better, better distributed income. And it would be a desirable shift. So total income for the world also would rise. At the same time, environmentally it would be better because the use of pesticides per unit output of agriculture would fall because the European agriculture is terribly pesticide intensive because it's artificially supported by high prices and high inputs. So here was a case where liberalizing trade was good for both environment and for trade. So a knee-jerk reaction which many of my environmental friends used to have, I've been in many debates with them, uh, with Teddy Goldsmith, uh, it was the leading British environmentalist, and we had a big debate in, in the Cambridge Union on this and then in Prospect Magazine. And I said, look, you can't say anything for sure. You will have to go case by case, and that's usually not a very sensible way to do it. Why not go for a proper environmental policy and push for that? So push for a world environment facility, push for more in agreements on pollution, and let free trade then take its course, because that's also going to go slow. It's not going to go that fast anyway. So, you know, have the two march in unison. So appropriate, govern appropriate governance would, include, would mean that you have to then have two sets of bodies, and for two sets of policies, so that which, are, which hand, go hand in hand and are moving forward. And that would take care of some of your concerns, you see, in turn. Um, so that is the, on the trade killing the environment. Uh, so that's a very elementary principles of e uh, in economic policy, which, you know, I've been writing about to some, you know, and some others for the last uh, 40 years or so, uh, how, to, how to handle this. And the same thing with culture. Uh, if I apply the same principle, have free trade in cinema, but have subsidies. Uh, Mr. Lamy was mentioned today, and I'm one of the people who, who thinks he was dissimulating when he said that he wanted a special deal for all trade barriers against the developing countries would go down. That will be the day when the French do it. Uh, don't believe them. Uh, but he's been talking about, Mr. Lamy, he's a trade commissioner for EU, he's been saying agriculture is multifunctional, uh, meaning people like greenery, people like a way of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this is true at one level. I mean, agriculture is a way of life, so Masha Bove has a point when he says we would like uh, greenery. We don't want to turn into American-style, you know, towns with just gas stations and Burger Kings and whatever, and no, no agriculture in certain areas. That's a, that's a cultural preference, okay? But then, if you take multifunctionality, many people suspect that he's simply raising this matter and saying, I don't want to do anything to agricultural protection. And being a smart Frenchman, he's just using this argument. The way to counter that is to say, okay, we open up other policy instruments. If you want greenery, we subsidize greenery as such, but not output of agricultural goods. You can just have grass, <laughs> right? You can have enclosures with you know, all sorts of ways in which we're subsidizing that, but we open it up to free trade. So the output is then 
uh, allocated to the poor countries. So we again open up another policy instrument and then expose his trickery for what it is. That multifunctionality doesn't mean you should not liberalize trade. So there are very elementary principles of which can be, as I said, told in folktale terms as always in economics, uh, the two birds and two stones this is, is the correct way to look at it. One more example on, on child labor. All of us worry about child labor if we are at all decent. But you have something like 200 million children at work in the developing countries. Senator ha uh, Harkin, who is a good, ha not just a good-hearted man, but a great-hearted man, you know, great liberal in the, in, in the Senate, he introduced a child deterrence bill, uh, child labor deterrence bill, as a result of which uh, that meant that you, countries could not export goods to us which were, which were using child labor. The effect of that was that in Bangladesh, the mothers used to bring their children to work in the textile factory in the 19th century style, you know, just be around in the family uh, and bring tea and do little chores and so on, were fired big, you know, immediately. And then Oxfam found, you know, in a study which has been much cited, but I must confess I've never seen it. I hope it exists. Uh, <laughs> But it's been cited and Oxfam hasn't denied it's everywhere. And it's, it's pointed out that the female children wound up in prostitution because the families were poor and wanted and needed the income. So my argument there again is that if you say that we're going to use only trade sanctions and trade treaties and trade institutions like WTO to eliminate the trade in child labor, that is not an appropriate instrument. To get at this problem, you have to get down to the NGOs, the civil society, uh, but there are so many of them in the developing countries, work with the governments which have come around to wanting to do, accelerate the process of reduction of child poverty or child labor. And we have programs at the International Labor Organization, like there's a very good program on the International Program for the Eradication of Child Labor, where funds are used with NGOs and so on, and doing all the heavy lifting, making sure the children, once they're taken out of, you know, out of work, then get into schools, instead of into things like prostitution of their girl children, or worse occupations, uh, that they actually, that the parents don't keel over and die because they're impoverished and, you know, will miss the income of these children, and so on. So that's a lot of heavy lifting of the kind, you know, the people who are genuinely interested in poverty will do. But when you simply say, look, I'm just going to use trade to do this, what happens? As a result, many developing countries have now come to the view, well, people are just out for trade sanctions. They think when we talk about child labor, it's because many of the unions which are involved in that, not, not the moral lobbies, um, are simply worried about competition. They just want to raise the cost of production. And they're putting a moral face on what is truly a, a competitiveness argument because they feel threatened on the textiles front because that's rapidly moving out to developing countries, particularly now that we are about to dismantle the multi-fiber agreement and remove the quotas. So whether it's true or false in terms of what the unions really feel, that's how it appears. And so we devalue the moral agenda. And there's not a single country in, in the, among the developing countries that I've visited or whose representatives I've talked to who doesn't believe we are a bunch of hypocrites pretending we are really against child labor. And we'll, all we want to do is to protect Unite uh, and our, our own, you know, highly protected industry in the United States. So we are devaluing a moral agenda by going the trade route. It's, it's a bit like, you know, I mean, in, in, when in the trade context, everybody works on trade and competition, you know, and getting an advantage in doing it, as Stiglitz was reminding us. And so it's a, you know, to try and bring in moral agendas there as things you push. Uh, is a bit like you know going to a poker party and asking, you know, expecting them to break into singing madrigals or something. I mean, they just you know they're good, busy telling dirty jokes and drinking hard whiskey uh, at, at poker games. So this is just not the right place. And two, you you undermine the trade agenda also, which I think is important because what what happens typically? Seattle broke up partly because many developing countries wouldn't play. They thought this was all, all of these agendas were against, you know, were really ways of trying to create problems for the developing country exports.
And the president was indebted to the unions, like you know, Vice President Gore is. And he, he said, unless you deal with this issue in, you know, by putting in the WTO, we can't have another negotiation. That was one of the sticking points. So we slow down, and he lost fast track renewal also because of that. So you're slowing down trade liberalization. You're slowing, you're devaluing your moral agenda. What you need is two instruments. Not put everything onto the trade treaties, but go ahead and develop ILO uh, as an alternative agency, which in fact was designed to advance these kinds of social agendas about workers' rights, children's la child labor, etc. Why not use that and beef it up? So people often say ILO has no teeth because there's no trade sanctions. So again, we get back to this basic problem of American mentality, that every, every, every knee-jerk reaction is we must use trade sanctions. It just doesn't work. People's backs are put up in many cases because which government is perfect enough to say, thou art bad and I'm virtuous? Of course, we, our government will do that. Uh, and so will the one I come from back home. I, I think in my book I say, uh, once I told a congressman, I said, I feel perfectly at home coming from India to the United States because I've come from one self-righteous country to another. And you know, the notion that our virtue is solid in any way it comes very hard to both countries. <laughs> And, and the whole, so I think really um, what I would like to see is the ILO develop in that. And then we say that it has no teeth because there's no trade sanctions. And I'm a believer in civil society and being able to work with it today. And I, you know, my first reaction was to say, let's open the ILO's mouth and put the teeth in after we are a superpower. Well, I have a better analogy. I say, God gave us not just teeth, but also a tongue. And a good tongue lashing can be much more effective, as Gandhi emphasized, uh, you know, in getting the British out by nonviolent means, uh, than just biting into something which, with, with teeth which are, you know, already about to fall out. Uh, so once you have NGOs, once you have uh, CNN, modern internet possibilities of finding out what people are doing. Look at what happened to Nike. Some subcontractor took some women out and put them into the sun because they were chattering rather than working on the assembly line. So he did what um, that Japanese officer does in Bridge on the River Kwai, if you remember, to Sir Alec Guinness, uh, I mean, some version of that. And immediately, you know, Nike had to pay because his reputation got in the mud. That is a much more potent instrument. The, the chamber orchestra from Vienna, which for 100 years had never admitted a woman. When it was coming here, many of our women's groups kicked up a big fuss, all right? Finally, they had to add a cellist, who was a woman, and then they came. That is a very powerful force. Maybe I'm too influenced by, by Gandhi and so on, but it seems to me that if you have a moral position, and I do believe things like ch removing child labor as rapidly as you can manage, um, doing a variety, you know, working for decent uh, work conditions for labor, etc. Very important moral agendas. And it seems to me that if you've got a good moral case, you should be able to convince people. It takes time. It does, but don't tell me that sanctions work better. Uh, they don't, typically. You can sign on to a sanction, you know, uh, or meaning you, know, you can say, yeah, okay, I'll do it because um, of the sanction. But will you enforce it? I mean, those, this is just a, the many wonderful Christians here. Uh, when you put these, during the Inquisition, the, the Jews on the rack, did you really convert them? I don't think so. As soon as the time was ripe, they declared their faith again. You have to go through the heart, convince the, these democratic, increasingly democratic societies, look, this is the way you want to think. And we've got a work cut out for us, but we can do that, and that's the, other stone, and it's a far more powerful stone actually than using trade sanctions. So those are, I mean, on, on a variety of these things, I would say the, uh, the worries about poverty, I think, are not well taken, and I don't have time to go into that if you're going to have Q&A. Um, the income distribution, I think, is the wrong question to ask. The culture, I think we have, it, possible different instruments with which we can, I think, get at most of those questions and maintain free trade. Similarly, for the environment, I think we can push for the right mix of solutions. 
and so on, and similarly for, for the labor standards. In, so instead, we have conflicts being sort of breaking out in all of these areas. Uh, and so let me get to the World Trade Organization more directly now. Uh, the World Trade Organization uh, is a new institution. Okay, it replaced the old GATT. So um, the old GATT was, a, was called General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Uh, and my student who runs the economics writing for the New York Times, he, Mike Weinstein, he said, during the last days of the Uruguay Round, he first, he said he had difficulty convincing the editors that the word Uruguay Round should be mentioned because they thought it was a Latin American dance uh, rather than a round of trade negotiations. He had brought them around to that. And then he wanted to use the word GATT, and he said, what is GATT? Uh, and actually, even my spell check, uh, when I typed in GATT once, it wanted me to change it to Matt, uh, who was a friend of mine and was in the spell check. Uh, so, you know, it, it was somehow a strange animal, uh, who was, which was not known even to sophisticated audiences like this one. And so, GATT, he said, can I use it? He said, no, what does it stand for? Can you, uh, oh, and then Mike said, maybe if I spell it out. So the editor said, must be Havel Reigns, I think, and uh, said, so Mike said, okay, I'll spell it out, general agreement on tariffs and trade. So the editor said, that makes it worse, and that was the end of the matter. So the New York Times could not bring this, uh, get it on. but it was a loose institution. It was not a real institution. It had come about because the International Trade Organization, which was part of the Bretton Woods structure, IMF, World Bank, and the ITO, was not approved by the US Senate, which wanted a very minimalist version. So this was a fallback option of an agreement. So it had no institutional structure. But one advantage of it was it was very loose. Uh, nothing was binding in terms of dispute settlement. Everything was settled politically. If there was a dispute, you went to, you know, people got, you know, the elite from these representatives got into cigar smoke field rooms and they solved the dispute, all right? We Americans said, no, this can't do. We've got to make it legalistic because we believe in laws and predictability and so on. Now it's become a binding mechanism. In the old days, nothing was binding. It was just an opinion. And the country that lost a case could block the decision from being adopted. Today, you'd need consensus to not have something adopted. That means it's become like our legal domestic processes and that creates a massive problem because that's where the notion of a big regulatory state and so on, you know, institution begins to come in and create problems for a variety of people in terms of sovereignty, domestic regulations, vis the environment and so on. They think they are at stake. So Ralph Nader, for instance, is against, you know, is worried about that aspect. Uh, not about the, he's not worried about free trade as such. Uh, anymore. He's worried about the way the, the institution is going to work. So the WTO is now also a single undertaking, again thanks to G1 of Stiglitz, namely United States, uh, because what it says is that it has to be all or nothing. If you want to be part of this trade body, which everybody has to be, you can't be outside of it, because a lot of your market excess, everything depends on being a member. This is why China was trying hard to get in. Russia is still not in, and there are many, some countries still pending, but because it protects you in certain respects. But it is now a single undertaking. In the old days, there was different codes uh, on subsidies and all sorts of things. They were called Tokyo Round Codes. And if 50 countries signed up for them, fine. They incurred greater obligations and got greater rights vis-a-vis -vis one another. It was done under GATON. But the countries that didn't want to sign on didn't do that. So supposing if you want to bring labor standards, and US, EU, et cetera, agreed, Norway, in the old rules, you could bring them in. And then India, Brazil, all sorts of countries which don't like it would have stayed out. And over time, maybe you could diffuse it to these people. Today, you've got to sign on to everything. It's all or nothing. And that came because of G1, because I used to go to meetings uh, of business groups and so on, uh, just to see what those guys were thinking. And typically, the, you know, they were saying, if India, Brazil, et cetera, don't want to sign on to what we are saying, we'll start our own organization. And to hell with those guys. They'll, you know, they'll be just left out in the cold. So there was a kind of hubris.
uh, and a Cartesian utopian approach that you're going to order the whole world for a borderless economy, to use Kenichi Omai's phrase, and everything was to be put in its place exactly the way we want it. <laughs> and so that has led to, and the dispute settlement being binding, has made a lot of countries uneasy, and including many NGOs at our end, very uneasy. So it's really got to be looked at again in a very big way. Uh, among the marchers at Seattle were, were in fact mothers. Uh, on Tuesday I saw them and you know, Monday there was a big NGOs meeting uh, and I was part of it from the platform. So I had to defend myself by saying I was a one person NGO. And my wife would have said I was a one person one person NG disorg rather than org, but uh, the, everybody was there, you know, and that's the day there was a, you know, the bomb threat had delayed the whole opening for about five hours. But the next day were all the demonstrations in the streets and so on. And then there were a bunch of mothers marching. So I, I they had plaque, they had buttons saying WTO red slash, uh, and then plaque was one of, you know, one of which was particularly evocative and said WTO sucks. So I picked a particularly small mother because I wanted to say something provocative to her. Uh, you know, I'm a coward. <laughs> and besides, she had a placard and I didn't have one. <laughs> so I went up to her and said, Madam, do you know that WTO was born in 1995? Uh, so she looked at me and then I said, well, that makes it virtually an infant and as you know, as a mother, infants suck, and then I ran away. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, it is a very young, very different institution from anything many of us had realized what it would be. So we have to go back to the drawing table and evolve it. And there, the voice of the, uh, what Havel would have called the parallel politics, not anti-politics, that's out because the communists were displaced. But if you displace, if instead of anti-politics, you say parallel politics, the voices of people, uh, many of whom are doing a careful work, as Joe pointed out, raising questions, those perspectives need to be heard. And that is where I think, you know, we'll have to work with them. And it's not a matter of democratic deficit. That's too, I mean, it's a nice phrase, but um, you are represented through your governments, but and everybody thinks they're not well represented by their governments. If we start encouraging that notion, uh, all governments will become illegitimate. And, and in the end, all that it means is the developing country governments will become illegitimate because our Ill illegitimacy will not really have any international salience, but other people's illegitimacy will, particularly if they are smaller powers. So I, I personally prefer to say every organization must hear these different perspectives because experts are not, I mean, at that level, you know, uh, are not fully aware of the perspectives which define them. Like Rubin, who is a good man, I'm sure, but when he is the U.S. Treasury Secretary, where has he come from? From Wall Street, his entire life was in Goldman Sachs. So when he goes ahead and says, Expanding the financial sector everywhere is a wonderful thing. He doesn't even know that it is because his mindset is completely crippled by having been on Wall Street. He cannot think beyond that, brilliant as he is. And certain things just don't occur to him because we're all defined by our experience. And, you know, I mean, economics to some is, is like literature. It's done best or worst from your own experience. I mean, when you just write about it from the armchair, it just doesn't have any, any ring to it. And so I think the, his experience was extremely limited. You need a variety of backgrounds. And the very responsible people in, outside of the street theater, the street theater is very idealistic kids for the most part, whom we have to engage in, in debate, arguments, and so on and so forth. And then there are the ones who have the battery of lawyers and experts and so on, like Sierra Club, et cetera. Uh, who are actually much better informed, who can provide perspectives which otherwise would be lacking. So I think we have to give them a, a structure. And it's already happened with World Trade Organization because that is what you have, uh, formal meetings, annual, semi-annual meetings with a number of NGOs going on continuously where they're allowed to provide points of view. 
So you have their voice, but you can't give them a vote. And this brings me to the last point on which I'll close. Uh, and that is, if we already have governments interacting and negotiating and so on, our own governments have NGOs on them now, thank God. You know, environmentalists, even John Sweeney can be seen everywhere. His nice, jovial self. You know, I've seen him at God knows how many meetings, you know, always with the U.S. delegation and the right ear of the right man, meaning President Clinton, continuously. So, uh, you know, it's been fixed. It's not just uh, Hank Greenberg of AIG and so on, you know, pushing for more financial liberalization, etc. So we have balanced it out. Now, if we want to go and have another formal vote, because most of the NGOs which have clout are based here, in the, in the rich countries, because they have more money. If I give them 25 bucks, that's, that's more than uh, an average NGO will see per month, probably, from anybody in, in the developing countries. So we've got a million NGOs in, in India, but they, they're small ones. They don't have this kind of financial cloud. Sierra Club has more budget than most of the countries, you know, which are players in this game. So they, many of the developing countries feel that if we give them a second vote, it will mean a second vote, or rather an additional vote, it will mean de facto a vote for the rich countries again. Because our NGOs are based, constrained by, I mean, that's not a criticism, it's just a fact of life. They're constrained by domestic politics. When it came to hormone-fed beef, it wasn't just culture. Well, the European NGOs went ballistic on it, on environment. None of our NGOs really signed up for it. Though normally there is solidarity because this is our own industry and you don't want to rock Al Gore because you want the democratic president. Uh, so, you know, our own choices, our own constraints, everything really reflects domestic culture, domestic politics, calculation, and so on. And they couldn't care. I mean, you know, there is some bit of cosmopolitanism, but it's not that's not what you should count on. That's what people out there say. So NGOs are dividing now, and so I think there's going to be progress, dynamic progress on this dimension. But basically, that is one of the problems. Or take, uh, I mean to, when I send my $1,000 next week to Ralph Nader, uh, I mean to say, look, here is this case which, uh, on the fiscal subsidies, um, we have $4.1 billion are given to Boeing, etc., uh, all our big corporations, as a dodge so that they can get an export subsidy of $4.1 billion, which the European Union then challenges as a, just a dodge against the subsidy restrictions. This is nothing else but corporate welfare, and the standard line, including by if there's some of the media here, is to go along and say the Europeans are making trouble for us. Uh, well, that better. I mean, you know, because these laws are to be taken seriously. It's true because they're responding to the fact that they, they lost a couple of cases where they're having difficulty, like on bananas and hormone-fed beef, where we have retaliated with massive straight sanctions just to, 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 to put pressure on them to accept the findings. So they play tit for tat, right? But it is a very good thing um, that this subsidy should be challenged. Public citizen, et cetera, should be coming. They're always against corporate welfare. Al Gore says he's against all these firms, right? These big firms, and his rhetoric is very populist. But where, do, where, you know, where are all of them? On, and I think it's partly because public citizen hasn't really caught up with it. It's got his mind on other things and getting Ralph Nader at least into the debate, which they haven't succeeded, unfortunately. Um, but that is the kind of thing where, again, our politics, our preoccupations of our own NGOs do make a difference. This is something which should be, you know, so I could give you countless examples where therefore many NGOs in the, in the developing countries feel that our NGOs don't necessarily speak for them. So aside from the NGOs versus corporate and other interests, which is the way the public debate on WTO is being formulated, partly thanks to our media, which never reports on anything of interest to the developing countries. It's always in terms of our own politics. We, we are missing this very important strand, which is, I think, creating a massive problem for the World Trade Organization, that we really have to give the developing countries also
much greater voice than they currently have and to their concerns. So the final concern which they have on the World Trade Organization side is that I think while most of them now realize that getting into a, a trade treaty uh, and having a rule of law is a protection against the kind of shenanigans that G1 might practice or, or Brussels and EU uh, against the rest of the world. We, we, we have wielded tr retaliation threats to get unilateral concessions from a variety of developing countries, which was part of the reason why they became great aficionados of the World Trade Organization. But now they see that it might actually be changing under the, 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 the new rules because, as Joe pointed out, we put in intellectual property protection. In 91, I was the first economist to say this doesn't belong to WTO because the main principle underlying a trade organization is what we teach in the classroom, that if I liberalize my trade with you in a non-coercive fashion, it's a voluntary exchange, we do both tend to be better off compared to what we were in terms of goods and services, you know, that we, are, we get more prosperity. And that's something we concede. Uh, there are exceptions which I would like to see in terms of, again, appropriate governance, in terms of different institutions working together also, which is that I think Joe also mentioned that the Uruguay round created a ma uh, two to three percent loss of income according to many calculations for the African countries. Well, it's, what do we do as a result of that, right? Because the countries that participate in the trade negotiation are likely to gain according to our theory. But that doesn't mean the third party, which is not actively playing, is not going to be hurt. Um, because we, our demand for their exports might fall off as a result of what we are doing, and then it hurts them. They're just innocent bystanders. When you have something like that happening for poor countries, surely you should be able to trigger immediate assistance from the World Bank and the IMF and from bilateral agencies like USAID so that you cushion the impact of, the, of this negotiation on the poor countries. Instead, we get more and more World Bank and other calculations coming out and saying, you know, is it 2%, is it 2.5%, is it 3%, none of which is totally credible anyway, because either, if you really saw how that sausage was made, you would not want to eat it almost, uh, because we make hundreds of assumptions and guesses and so on. And you come out with a neat number, which everybody thinks is scientific, ha <laughs> ha. You know, it's, uh, but, that, but, but basically, if, if a lot of studies show that Africa is going to get hurt by way, you, you should get mobilized. Nothing was done on that front at that time. Bananas dispute. E EU and US fight like two big giants, you know, uh, or elephants, and then things get trampled upon. So the WTO correctly says you cannot have preferences for the Caribbean countries. You have to have multilateral non-discriminatory trade, a good trade principle. But the effect of this decision, if implemented, would be that the small Caribbean nations, which are our neighbors, uh, and which are not exactly rich, all right, that they would suffer a loss of income of about a third of their GNP. Now, that's, that's a terrible loss, so they, they're really worked up. I would say when you implement something like this, or even when you decide on a, a judgment which is binding of that kind, you know, and someday EU will have to implement it, uh, then there must be immediate trigger mechanism by which you compensate. And these are, a small compensation will go a long way because these, the, while the losses are big for these countries, they're very small for the rest of the world to finance. So we haven't really thought of institutional structures where we say, look, trade, is good, but where trade might harm some people, uh, and particularly poor countries, and we have not really thought through that part of the mechanism. But going back to IPP, intellectual property protection doesn't meet the defining principle, which is that it should be a mutually gainful transaction or negotiation, uh, which is what underlies a trade negotiation. Why? Because mainly as Stiglitz was pointing out, and one could elaborate on it, it is basically the user countries, which are mainly poor countries, who are absorbing technology or using it, who are going to have to pay royalties to us, to our companies. 
and who pushed for this, nonetheless, into the WTO. So we were trying to, well, so let, another way of putting it is that this is a ripoff of the developing countries. Of course, we may say, look, it is, you know, we invented it, therefore it belongs to us. Uh, yes, but then why even have a 20-year patent protection? Why not have it infinitely? So at some stage, we are doing a cost-benefit analysis of, you know, when you want to do it. So we're not going purely by the rights approach. It's invented by me, so it's mine. Get lost. We are saying 20 years is a good idea. So then we use sort of utilitarian ethics for that, you know, which is the best m maximum good being done. Essentially, it's a redistributive mechanism. We are turning WTO into a royalty collection agency for our pharmaceutical companies. And who pushed for it? The pharmaceutical companies and a few software companies, including Microsoft at the time. And they said, and Mickey Cantor, I mean, it started under Carla Hills, under President Bush, but in Loki, uh, and I don't think it would have been pushed through, but Mickey Cantor, uh, I recommend you meet him just to see how interesting a Los Angeles lawyer can be outside even of the Simpson trial, because uh, he's a Los Angeles litigator. Uh, and I've often wondered because, you know, I mean, I've met a lot of jurists who are perfectly good visionary people, but the litigators, I think it rhymes with alligator and that more or less evokes the, uh, the kind of image you would want uh, of these people. He pushed hard for our administration, for the Gore-Clinton administration, extracted the maximum, a 20-year patent formula and shoved it into the, the whole thing into the, uh, made it a precondition for, for the round to be finished. And for years, I sort of kept talking about it. And finally, I gave up because we, I felt, well, I mean, you know, what could you do? You, there was, you couldn't really reach the end of the round. Washington was talking about, and our business lobbies, that, you know, who cares about multilateralism and so on, we'll fix bilateral deals and so on and get our way. Because if you get a developing country one at a time, you're better off because you can use your entire power to, to extract from them whatever you want. And Salinas had to play that game because Salinas had to walk over his own grandmother, which he might have done anyway, I don't know. But the point is we extracted a great deal from Mexico, which Mexico would never have given if it was a multilateral negotiation, along with the other developing countries. We put an IPP, all sorts of things there, and we managed to get this. So we first, we Americans, unfortunately, first breached the principle of what should be in the WTO. And we did it purely for our lobbies. And with Nader, I will say they're corporate lobbies, all right? It could have been put somewhere else. You know, you could have had trade sanctions, but it should not have been put into the WTO. We corrupted the WTO, number one, but at the expense of the using countries, which are the poor countries, right? So we built in a transfer payment as against mutual gain. Next, now, labor lobbies come and say, you did it for capital, meaning these corporations. Now you've got to do things for us, for labor. So we are worried about competition from abroad. So you've got to, you know, do all sorts of things, which sound reasonable. As I said, you know, they have a moral aspect to it in some cases, but we have to have fast track action on child labor, right? Maybe 200 million children at work, forget it. Immediately the president has to go for a social clause, which basically outlaws child labor and a variety of things. So we, then the developing countries say, look, here now, this particular additional leg on which WTO stands now is trying to grow other legs, right? Our labor union saying, our corporations got this, therefore we must get it. So what you did for capital must be done for labor. And then some of the environmentalists, not all of them, because one part of the environment, which is a very complex phenomenon, and there are lots of legitimate things in the environment, the environmentalists say what you did for capital has to be done for nature. And it goes on. So depending on which lobby in our system is effective, it gets formulated into these demands. And when you look at them, and I don't have time to look at them in depth, they always look like daggers aimed at poor countries, and quite legitimately so, because they're, con they're, they're devised not in the moral context of de devising
the civil and political rights at the UN or the child, children, you know, the, the Covenant on the Child 94, uh, also in the UN and so on. It is being done in the trade context. Therefore, it immediately gets selectively biased in such a way that the defendants are expected to be just the developing countries, the rich, poor countries and not the rich countries. So what has happened is now is there's a huge north-south divide, which you don't read about in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or anywhere, uh, but it's going to hit the fans pretty soon, as I say, in New York. Uh, and it is, this is what we need to uh, address in, in, in looking at the WTO. So many developing countries now, not because they're devils with horns in their head, but because many of them actually even have, like India, have more standards, uh, more protection for labor than over here, but they just think that the WTO is being captured by us, uh, by the European powers, on, in addition, uh, in a way uh, which turns the WTO into an assault on the weak powers. The traditional view was that tr by getting into a trade body, you'd be, it would be a defense of the weak. Now, and that is true still on trade, but on the non-trade issues, all these lobbies putting in their two cents worth, it is turning into a, an assault on the, uh, on the weak nations. So that's where the real crisis is. Uh, and I think the NGOs will have to, are waking up to that and deciding how to best handle it. Thank you. Once again, if you have questions for Dr. Baigwadi, you can write them down and you can give them to the ushers. I'd also let you know that we have complimentary coffee and hot cider available outside in John's course yard. And if we could assemble our panelists here, we'll get ready and we'll see if we can have a few questions for Dr. Bhagwati. Thank you. 
We're going to try to get the Q&A portion of the program underway promptly here. <clears throat> as we've uh, slipped a little bit in time as the day has progressed. We have a few questions from the audience already available to put to our panel members, to Professor Baguati and to the others on our panel who might choose to comment on them. If you have questions to give to the ushers, would you do that as promptly as possible, and we can continue to funnel those questions up to the front here and have as many of them addressed as we can. First question we have for Professor Bhagwati. Globalization causes people to lose the personal connection to the goods they consume. For instance, I don't know who made my shoes. Shouldn't we encourage locally produced products to give me a common identity? I, <laughs> that argument doesn't appeal to me because I'm quite, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a modern consumer who will take things from wherever they come. I mean, it's very hard to determine today in modern economy anyway who did what. I mean, it's like the bionic man or the six million dollar man and made up of transplants from all sorts of places. Um, the Japanese have used this kind of argument to some extent, like we have to grow our own rice uh, in order to have agricultural protection. It just doesn't sound right. If you're wearing a hula hoop or something, it's fine, but if you're like the Japanese, it just, you know, it seems like an, a dodge for protectionism. But I think this nostalgia for um, doing your own thing, which, which you can find actually in the self-sufficient villages and so on of Gandhi as well, which Dr. Cobb mentioned, it, I don't think it's a workable thing uh, in, in today, because largely because of the diffusion of ideas and tastes. I mean, you know, if you ask the indigenous communities, truly isolated ones, and said, look, I mean, if they, if they could watch television and see things, they would be rushing to take, you know, get to uh, the town and then to Bombay, then to New York, then, and so on and so forth. It is one of these things which I think we have to be, we can't really slow down. I, I would, my reaction is to go the route of cultural preservation and so on, like the, National Trust of Scotland, and a lot of us do that, you know, mark out areas where uh, we want to preserve something from the past, uh, and then, then have an appropriate, you know, policy to it. Am I too close? No. You need to be closer. I think you're... Oh, think you're I'm, I, it's sort of almost touching my nose. <laughs> so I, I, I was just saying that, you know, you, you cannot stop the flow of history when... when the world is collapsed through the communications network into where people see other things. So historically, people have always moved from the village to the town, to the city, to foreign cities, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's an endless, ongoing process. And many of us do have these impulses to preserve some heritage, some indigenous community, perhaps, which really badly wants to stay that way. And I think we should simply find the monies to do that and, and the suitable NGOs. But if we start wringing our hands about uh, things that are van going to vanish, uh, it's going to be very hard. L like, I mean, uh, in my debate with Teddy Goldsmith, he had exactly the same worries. And I said, look, this is virtually in every country and every culture, you know, men of literature like, you know, Tanizaki in Japan has a wonderful essay with nostalgia about the vanishing Japan. I mean, you can, you know, it's very evocative, it brings tears to your eyes, but what do you do with it? I mean, you know, you simply uh, can't isolate communities anymore. And so all we can do is try and, you know, see if there's something to preserve, if we can agree on that. And that is what the things like National Trust of Scotland are. And I'm sure we have lots of those things, preserving different areas, different cultures, so basically using subsidies and NGOs and, uh, and our own government subsidies to, to, to do it. Um, I know little stores are disappearing. This part of the anger against Starbucks is precisely that. It's displacing little coffee shops. 
and Borders and um, Amazon uh, Borders and what's the other store? Barnes and Noble uh, are displaced. Um, you know, many bookstores are going out. Like there's a lovely store called Shakespeare, and today you just have these big chains. Uh, of course, they've got their own life. I don't even know why I mean, they themselves are under pressure from further technology because they're also likely to go under if Amazon.com works. And if you go to Barnes & Noble in New York, one of the many stores, usually they have a cafeteria. And it seems to me like it has become a place where you pick up people uh, for a date. You don't really go there to buy a book. If you want to buy a book, you really order it on Amazon.com. So, you know, everything is changing continuously. Um, <laughs> And there's nobody, even God can't stop it, I think. <laughs> we have a pair of questions that address the environmental theme. They have a slightly different focus to them, but I think it will be best to give them both to you at once. <clears throat> First one says, you said, quote, if I harm the environment, I have to pay for it, close quote, just following the jab at the libertarian mistrust of government. Yet there is no force more inefficient in the market than government. Please expand how government enforcement of I just have to pay for it will affect improvement in the free trade environmental dichotomy. And the other question concerning the environment says, to truly address environmental problems, isn't it better to work with the concerns of local people rather than global environmental NGOs? You can have both, to, in answer to the last question. I mean, there's no magic bullet again. Now, if you have a government which is very much in the hawk to, to anti-environmental interests, then of course it's a, it's a bigger battle ahead of you to do that. But I, I would say that in many cases, like um, uh, polluter pay principle in the European Union, I think Mrs. Ullman can talk to it, there's substantial progress towards being, you know, towards freezing out people who will not do it. Um, and I think it's an evolving situation. True, you can't do it outright, because there are other interests arrayed against that. But I think this is exactly where uh, thinking has, has evolved. And the only problem which I didn't mention was that um, those tax rates can be different in different countries depending on fundamentals. Uh, like in Mexico, you may have, uh, you may want to attach greater priority to getting cleaner uh, water because people don't have these little Perrier bottles and so on and so forth and cleaners and filters, which you know, we have to defend ourselves. Besides, our water is cleaner anyway. Uh, and sometimes I think my daughter was carrying vodka or gin in that <laughs> because I, I, I just drink Giuliani water. Uh, and, uh, but in Mexico, where dysentery is a major problem and people don't have the funds to do it, I would say that is probably something to which you would attach a higher tax rate and maybe a little bit less on cleaner air than we, we would. So the priorities of sequencing, et cetera, can be different. This again gets back to what Joe and I were talking about, that we, you know, these are, many of these decisions should not be levied by us. Like, you know, you must have that tax rate. You know, you, you teach them, you educate, you interact with them and say, look, these are things which you need to do uh, and figure out your own tax rates. I would not say counterweight. If your tax rate is lower, that somehow you're a shirker or something, because I would expect those tax rates to be different. Professor Stiglitz? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, what Jackie uh, said. There's just one other uh, comment I want to make, which is to distinguish between some global environmental issues like global warming and local environmental issues, which are environmental issues focusing on one community. It seems to me that particularly for local environmental issues, the in, local groups are the appropriate forum. Sure. For the global environmental issues, like the global environment and, and, and greenhouse gases, uh, there really is a need for uh, global environmental uh, NGOs. And let me just ask, uh, pick up one question I asked Jagdish about, which in his view of the separation, uh, in the Montreal Convention, which has to do with the ozone gases, there was a provision, I believe, for trade sanctions as a last uh, ditch enforcement mechanism. Uh, it hasn't had to be invoked because there was sufficient consensus behind uh, that agreement and there was compliance without the sanctions. But do you feel comfortable with that as a backdrop sanction uh, in, 
in an international convention on the environment? I think if you have a sufficient majority, uh, a sufficient plurality, uh, I would feel comfortable. As you say, it's never come up. This is a theoretical issue at the moment. But I do think that unless you have real free riders, sometimes you're going to have people who don't want to get onto the bus rather than people who want to ride along because they don't agree with your diagnosis or you, they think the particular allocation of burdens is not fair or equitable, like the sort of things you and I had today. Um, so one has to be a bit careful about you know, what kind of thing we're doing. And actually, the developed countries have been rather sensible on things like Kyoto. Whether we can get it through the Senate is another matter. But what we have done is to actually assist the developing countries financially, technologically, in those agreements to come on board. And so the distribution burden has been rather reasonable. This is the sort of thing which is lacking in the WTO decisions because it's just left to you, right? We don't have, like uh, the shrimp turtle, let me just take, which is uh, what we call a values related. Many, many environmentalists quite naturally get upset that if the United States has a law saying you must use turtle excluding devices, TEDs, not Kennedy, te te TEDs meaning turtle excluding devices, which are narrow, nets with narrow necks. Um, and they must be used before your shrimp can be exported. And it is motivated by the desire to, 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 to save the turtles. And four countries, four poor countries, or, you know, including India, uh, brought a case against that. Um, and actually, the, the, the problem at issue was whether we could unilaterally say that the way you know, whether, whether these nets are being used or not can be a decisive factor in whether something can be important. When you look at it just in, you know, without further thinking about it, you say, why not? You know, because this is our country and, you know, we have the same law here. Why not the same law, you know, apply to imports? Well, the problem with that is basically, and this is, you know, uh, is that these countries are saying, look, um, we will enter into negotiations on something like this and then arrive at an agreement. That wasn't done by the United States. They just went and passed the law unilaterally. Two, nothing is built into it by way of assistance to buy the nets or anything like that, which is what you would have if you had a negotiation. After you're doing it for Kyoto, and do you know how much it costs to, uh, to buy a TED in Walmart? I know Walmart is not very popular, but leave that aside. Uh, it's 50 bucks a piece. Now, I don't know how many fishermen there are. I haven't done my homework. But you'd probably be, for the cost of a, not a conference here, which is hopefully very Spartan, uh, <laughs> but a USAID or a World Bank conference. If you drop three of them, you would, so, you would buy the debts, give them to these poor countries, end of the problem. So again, it gets back to what I said, the litigator's problem. And even the environmental, the better, big environmental groups are full of lawyers, you know, well-heeled lawyers, you know, and I, I don't want to sound terribly anti-lawyers, but the notion that you can open up a range of different instruments and really say, look, are we really interested in a big fight over this or are we really interested in settling it? And it is so easily settled, and we don't have to do anything like this because we have conceded that principle in the big cases. Why not use it in the little? So I think uh, that goes back to WTO governance again. I think if you had more NGOs, sort of, you know, on parallel talks and so on, our NGOs in India could talk to NGOs here because, uh, the, you know, one very major prize winning, uh, environmental prize winning NGO activist in India. I actually wrote an article just three months ago saying he was going to work as our software, as it were, trying to get Indian government to, to adopt TEDs, but he said he would fight to the death the U.S. attempt at doing it. So, you see, this is the problem, <laughs> uh, that we come across as, I think, what did you say, bullies or something, or hi hi hypocritical, because our congressmen would be walking down the steps of Capitol Hill and screaming their heads off if somebody said, look, you shouldn't have chickens producing batteries, you shouldn't have hogs and pens where they can barely breathe, and so on and so forth, and we're simply going to stop all exports. So we don't like your sweatshops in uh, New York, and there are lots of them. Whole textile exports are going to be stopped. 
All of shrimp exports were stopped from India, incidentally. Only 5% is done without TEDs. So we have done, I, I think we need more goodwill. I think there's much more scope for getting the two, two, two groups to go forward together. Of course, there are some residual conflicts that are bound to be there, but we, we maximize the number of conflicts unnecessarily. So I, 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 this is why I work with environmentalists and talk to them because you know, it, it is possible to negotiate better solutions, I think, like we've done on the MEA, multilateral environmental agreements, as they're called, ozone and Basel and so on. I think in an effort to try to keep uh, close to schedule here, we should probably plan on taking a break and then uh, we'll reconvene shortly for our final lecture, which will be by Mr. Michael Solman.